Hi, this is Synth Chaser with SynthChaser.com. Uh, today I'm uh, finishing a recap uh, for Steve's ARP Omni 2. Uh, he had uh, purchased one of my kits and started uh, doing the recap. And uh, he did these, these boards here and the power supply. And then uh, kind of lost steam in the project. And uh, so I'm uh, finishing it up for him. And the first board that I pulled out uh, to, to recap was uh, this uh, string control board. And uh, that, that's this board here with the four buttons that select the string voices. And uh, I turned it over and, uh, and I started to desolder these two caps here. And I noticed, look at this toasty mess here. And uh, I turned it over and looked and this resistor here is just burned up. Uh, so that to me would indicate that there's a short with these tantalum capacitors. Um, so I might have just stumbled on to the reason that the keyboard didn't work uh, with the very first part that I went to desolder. Uh, but we're going to uh, pull them out and, uh, and change all of the, the tantalum capacitors. These short out very frequently in the ARP Omni. Uh, particularly uh, these ones here on the voicing boards. They'll cause notes to be stuck on. Uh, someone at some point uh, recapped the ones on this board. Um, but uh, the tantalum capacitors of this era, you, you definitely need to get them out of your synthesizer. They're just disasters waiting to happen. And uh, when they go, they can take other stuff with them. So we're going to replace this resistor and um, uh, continue the recap of the keyboard. So I've pulled the two capacitors out from that string control board and I pulled the remnants of the charred uh, 100 ohm resistor that was next to it out and uh, we can now take a look at these. Um, if, the, if one or both of these are shorted that would explain the, uh, the charred resistor and why the keyboard wasn't working. These are two 22 microfarad capacitors that are in parallel so basically it makes a, a 44 microfarad capacitor. I guess they were too cheap to buy 47 microfarad capacitors and they had lots of 22s on hand so they stuck two there but that's that's fine. Um, but the net result, if if one of them uh, shorts then then the whole thing is, is considered shorted. So there's several different measurements that we can take of capacitors. There's the ESR which we which I have an ESR meter for. There's the actual capacitance meter. Some capacitors uh, values change over time. Um, and I uh, have a capacitance meter for that. In this case we want to see if these capacitors are shorted and for that we're going to use a regular multimeter. So I turn the multimeter on, have it on ohms, and then it doesn't matter which uh, order you connect the leads, you know, whether the positive goes to the positive or the negative goes to the negative, there should be no continuity. So here um, there's no continuity between the two leads of the capacitor, so this one is good. Uh, so let's test the next one. And this one is measuring 0 ohm, so it's shorted. So as I suspected, uh, we have a shorted capacitor uh, which burned up this resistor and, and could explain why the keyboard's not working. There may be more reasons why the keyboard's not working. And uh, because this is a common failure mode on, on the ARPs, uh, these, these blob capacitors, the tantalum capacitors, we're going to continue changing out all of them, even though we, we found one that's bad. We're not going to assume that's the only one. And we want to change them out because if you know one of them failed, then other ones will too. So um, on the ARPs, I, I replace all of these capacitors with, with new capacitors um, uh, to avoid these kinds of problems in the future. I've moved on now to the lower voicing board, and I've taken the board out. and. Uh, these resistors always look a little bit toasty, but this one where it's charred the board underneath uh, looks a bit worse than, than normal. So uh, we're going to replace this resistor and, uh, and check to see if this capacitor near it is shorted. So I pulled this uh, capacitor out here that was next to a charred resistor and we're going to test to see if it's shorted. Um, get my leads on it. Here we go, 7.72 kilo ohms. So uh, it is shorted. Uh, it should be an open circuit. Um, it's not like a, a dead short with no resistance, but essentially it, 
it is shorted. Um, and then pulling the uh, first resistor off, you can see that the board is, is burned there. And I can't tell if that's just on this other resistor, if it's just melted goo from the first resistor, or if it's um, if it's a uh, damage to that resistor. So I'm going to change that too. And uh, this is why it's really, really important to to change all of these tantalum capacitors in the ARP, ARP keyboards. So you saw what what uh, this shorted cap did to this resistor, and it's not even a dead short yet, and it, it destroyed that resistor, burnt the board. Well, this chip. This chip uh, right here is a top octave generator, and uh, you can see that it's uh, connected to that resistor um, that that burned, and uh, that's a very expensive chip to replace if it if it goes bad. So you want to get the tantalum capacitors out of there to protect the irreplaceable parts that are inside your keyboard. Steve had gotten to the 4075 filter and uh, he was concerned because he damaged some traces on this board and wanted me to, to check his work. So I took the filter out and on the back I do see uh, a number of uh, lift, lifted pads or damaged pads like, like this one. Um, and I found that uh, all but one, one resistor is not... Um, is, is not connected properly. This one right here. So I'm going to desolder that and replace it with a new one. So with the recap finished, it's time to fire this up and see if it, uh, if it comes back to life. So first we'll test the string voices. And it looks like nobody is home. Oh. Well, two notes uh, make noise. Uh, but they don't sound right. And then for the synthesizer, also nobody's home. It's just these, these two notes down here. Synth bass, nothing. So uh, this needs a bit of troubleshooting and repair, and we'll do that now. So a good starting point for troubleshooting no output is along the, this row of diodes. Uh, so the Omni 2, like the Omni 1, and the Solina String Ensemble, uh, they're not truly polyphonic synthesizers, even though you can play all 49 notes at the same time. Uh, there, there's really one oscillator. Um, and uh, that is divided down to the frequencies for each of the notes on the keyboard. So the way it starts up here at this tuning coil, it makes a square wave, and this chip, the top octave generator chip, divides that square wave down to the frequencies for each note in the top octave of the keyboard, so 13 notes. Then it goes through these chips, which divide it in half and quarters and eighths to get to the, the notes for the lower octave. Then it goes through this, uh, row of resistors and a resistor network and capacitors which shape it into a uh, square uh, sorry change the square wave into a sawtooth and this band of, uh, of diodes clips the negative side of that so if we run down this side of these diodes we should expect to see uh, square uh, sorry sawtooth waves uh, corresponding to each note on the keyboard so I look at the first one and I see nothing the second one nothing Fourth, no, ninth. Well, here, here I'm seeing something, but uh, I'm on auto trigger and it's not triggering. So let's uh, put it on single triggering, and uh, and you can see that the uh, the pulse width on this is not it's not a repeating pattern, and it's not it's not uh, first of all the wave is not a sawtooth wave. And then second, uh, the, the pulse width on this is not even. It should be evenly spaced with the frequency of the note that, uh, that, we're, uh, that that diode corresponds to. So let's then check our top octave generator chip and make sure that that's working correctly. 
So the input to that comes from the tuning coil and this, uh, this uh, CMOS chip here, and it comes in on pin 2. So let's take a look at this. And I see a, a square wave with a frequency of 499.8 kilohertz. So that's correct. Uh, the input to the top octave generator chip, chip is a uh, um, negative 15 volt square wave with a 500 kilohertz frequency. So now each one of these outputs is, uh, should be the frequency, should be a square wave with the frequency of one of the notes on the keyboard. So I'm gonna just take a look at them and see. Um, so this pin here, it's again not triggering, so I'm gonna put it on a single trigger. And again, the duty cycle is, is, is incorrect. It should be a 50% duty cycle. So something seems to be wrong with this chip. I can take a look at some of the other outputs. Look at this one. It's just like very slowly going from negative 15 up to zero. So this, this top octave generator chip is, this one has no output. This one, again, is not triggering, so it's got to be, a, yep, in a regular duty cycle. Uh, irregular duty cycle. Another slow one. So this chip got messed up, and uh, this chip is basically right on that trace of the, that, that got burnt uh, with the burnt resistor uh, and the shorted tantalum capacitor. So probably when that tantalum capacitor shorted out, this, this chip got damaged. So we're going to replace this chip, the top octave generator chip. We're going to put it in a socket. Um, and then we're going to see, we're going to move on, no doubt, in, undoubtedly to the next problem that we've got to resolve. But uh, we've got to get these uh, notes working before we can even troubleshoot further. So I've changed the top octave generator chip here. And uh, I managed to take the old one out without uh, damaging any of the legs, and I put a socket here. Uh, I'm going to give the old chip back to the customer in case he wants to pop it in and confirm that uh, confirm what I saw. But now uh, I've turned it back on. The two notes that were working are actually making the correct sound. And I'm going to run down these diodes again. And this is what I would expect to see. Uh, I guess it's a sort of a sawtooth uh, wave uh, with a repeatable frequency. See, my oscilloscope is now triggering correctly on this. Uh, it says that the frequency on that's about two kilohertz. Uh, I'll look at some of the other ones. So the frequencies are gonna be different for each of these because each, each one of these represents a different note on the keyboard. Uh, but on these, I'm getting all sawtooth waves all the way down. And then I can go back to the top octave generator ch chip. I'll move the, because uh, this is negative going. So again, here's the, uh, the input. So I need to uh, widen this up. So 500 kilohertz input. And then just poking some of the output pins. I am triggering. I'm getting square waves. Or mostly square waves, uh, but with a with a constant frequency, repeatable, uh, uh, constant pulse width and repeatable frequency. So uh, this was successful in in resolving this problem. But now we need to look into why only these two notes on the keyboard work. So um, I will do that. All the notes except for the one or two down here not working was resolved pretty easily. Uh, there's these four ribbon cables that connect these boards to the key bed. And uh, the brown wire is, is, is uh, strand number one. And uh, on this uh, connector, there's a notched corner for pin number one. And uh, when they plug into a socket, the socket also has a notch, which indicates pin number one. So the notch side of the cable plugs into the notch side of the socket. 
and the factory when they put the sockets on the bottom of the keyboard uh, installed them backwards so or someone who came along afterwards uh, they looked original to me but uh, they were installed backwards so the notch side on the cable does not plug into the notch side on the socket so by unplugging one of these and testing continuity between the uh, the key contacts underneath I found that the the sockets were reversed and, and just turn the cables around in the socket and now uh, that, that resolved that problem. So now uh, once I did that I went through the keyboard one or two notes still didn't work and I fixed that by cleaning the bus bar so now all the notes work And I went through the functionality of the synthesizer and uh, found that uh, everything is working with the exception of the uh, synthesizer bass, uh, which is completely dead. So a string bass, though, is working fine. Uh, synthesizer voice is working fine, the, the, uh, the four foot and eight foot synth. And uh, all, all the different types of strings are working fine. Those are monophonic uh, synthesizer uh, string sounds, the bass, the bass and the cello. So uh, I need to take a look at why the uh, synthesizer bass isn't working. The uh, bass voice was also an easy fix. It turned out to be a cracked solder joint on uh, the bass output jack. Uh, you wouldn't think that that would cause uh, cause the bass not to work, but it actually uh, it actually routes to the mixer through the through the jack. Uh, so if the, there's a cracked solder joint on that jack, or the jack is uh, is broken, uh, then it could explain why the uh, the bass voice is mixing, missing from the main mix. So now the synthesizer is complete, we can send it back to Steve and he can start making some good music with it. Thanks for watching. This is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Bye.